just share my screen so that we can begin. Share. Okay. Uh, yeah. And full view. Okay, so this talk is going to be about hydrodynamic transport in two dimensional tidal materials. And in particular, we will focus on Hall viscosity, which is a transport coefficient that arises when one has parity and translational, uh, parity and time, and time reversal broken in two dimensions. This can be uh, obtained, for example, if we apply a magnetic field. Now I will divide the talk into the following blocks. Firstly, a quick motivation and overview on hydrodynamics uh, in the last years. years. Secondly, some quick preliminaries concerning the hydrodynamic description that we will uh, apply. Third and fourth block are uh, devoted to analyze the whole viscosity for the setup that we are going to, to work with. That I will explain it to you in a second. Making a particular distinction on whether we are at small temperature or at room temperature, which I would refer it to be as large temperature, usually around 300 Kelvin. And we will point out different ways of um, deriving, of reading off the whole viscosity for two dimensional channels, relying or taking advantage of knowing what is the dependence, the functional dependency on the, on the space parameter that this contribution will have to observables. And in particular, we will pick one observable, which is the whole voltage drop, the transverse whole voltage drop. You have your sample and you have contact gates and you measure your whole voltage drop. Now, mm, just quickly introduced to very nice papers, although there are other papers around in the literature, very extremely nice. The first one is uh, back in 1995, uh, where Mollenkamp and John Group reported of existence of a peak in the dV over di measurement as a function of the longitudinal current. And they related this peak to be the Gurji peak when you have a transition, a smooth transition between two different regimes. In the first regime, you are ballistic. You have electrons scattered to the boundaries, mostly. But as you increase the density, you start introducing electron-electron scattering, and you jump into another regime, which is the Poisson regime, hydrodynamic regime. And was this was signaled by a decrease in dV over di. Uh, by the way, I very fine if you have any questions or comments at any point. So, please interrupt me at, at any point. I mean, I would like if we can make this a little bit interactive. This was one paper and other paper came, that came out relatively recently were by Sufizio et al. team at Weizmann Institute. They visualized the Poisson fluid flow. So this is your, this is your channel. And you have inside here, the electrons that collide with each other really quickly, really fast. And when they, this whole bunch of colliding electrons moved along the channel, they got this parabolic profile, which is the Poisson profile, a kind of hydrodynamic profile. Now, hydrodynamics is an effective field theory, really when you are at low frequency and around thermal equilibrium, you have to be close to thermal equilibrium in order to apply this. And this statement translated into solid state systems, into electron, uh, into electron systems, yeah, means that the electron-electron mean free path, which is the momentum conserving scale that you have, the one that assures that you can have reach local thermalization, needs to be much smaller than any other length scale that you may have in your system. That is, for example, the momentum relaxation, including impurities that come from Dude. Or phonon, uh, or phon electron phonon impurity, uh, phonon electron mean free path, or the width of the channel W, or the cyclotron radius RC. Otherwise, you are very likely to jump into Landau levels and so on. Now, in what remains of this talk, I will focus on the hydrodynamic 
fluid motion that you have for two dimensional channels where the fluid velocity also called drift velocity in uh, in some in some in some places is referred as the poisson fluid flow regime and typically it's a parabolic like fluid flow so in essence you have your two dimensional system you have your width of a channel you have the length of a channel this is x and y direction you have elect uh, you apply an electric field the electrons are moved are pushed through coulomb force and since they are colliding with each other a lot, this whole bunch of electrons move as a fluid. That is parameterized by a single degree of freedom, which is the velocity profile. In principle, for this setup, once you know the shear viscosity, because you are, uh, since you are incompressible, that's the only transport coefficient that enters in the game for this particular setup. However, if on top of that, you apply a magnetic field, you allow for parity and, and time reversal breaking in. And when you do that, you allow for a new form of transport, which is the hole viscosity. I will refer to it as hole viscosity. And I will explain shortly what's the picture of, uh, of the hole viscosity. What does it represent? There are some nice papers out there that derive the, the whole viscosity from kinetic theory. I merely cite two of them uh, from Alex Seth and for Narosny. Um, essentially, these two coefficients that now represent and now characterize our hydrodynamic fluid depend on the magnetic field, on the applied magnetic field that we have through the cyclotron frequency here and here. Notice, by the way, that if you don't have a magnetic field you get, a, you get a, that the whole viscosity vanishes. This is consistent. And now we proceed to examine the fluid, meaning that we will run simulations and examine the input parameter space. How does the fluid change? How does the whole voltage drop changes as we move around, as we scan around the input parameter space? And from there, trying to figure out how can we dis turn, distinguish the whole viscous contribution? How can we read off the whole viscosity in an experiment? Now, what are these two transport coefficients? The shear viscosity is, goes back to Landau before I was born. Uh, essentially, it's the inherent resistance that you have between adjacent layers. Uh, the higher your viscosity is, more friction you introduce between your adjacent layers that uh, configure your fluid. And the whole viscosity, I know that the whole viscosity has been related to, to topological insulators for other reasons. Uh, we will not stick to, to that definition. We are away from, from, from uh, Landau levels and so on. Our description is continuum. Essentially, what parameterizes the whole, this, what, what tells us the whole viscosity is how likely is our system to display a transverse deviation. Of course, if we, if we crank up the magnetic field enough, we will get a lot of uh, transverse momentum due to Lorentz effect. But the question here is how naturally is our fluid to display this um, transverse deflection? Question, as I told before, how does the whole viscosity affect the electron hydrodynamic transport? How does it affect the the, the Poisson fluid flow regime that we had before, that I introduced before. We will examine it, and from there, from examining the functional dependence, we will propose some ways to identify this effect, the whole viscosity experimentally. David, I have a quick question before you yes. continue. Uh, basically, can, can you go back to your not previous, but Fuga before that, where you introduced the uh, whole viscosity and the result for this one, and I think now the one before, right? So I see there uh, the, these expressions. You know, it, it's basically my innocence, but I see the expressions that do make sense to my mind. Right? So you have this whole relaxation time tau c out there. Yes. And I have uh, the expression that goes like t squared log mu over t. Uh, I guess you are in two dimensions, and when I remember this correctly, this is coincident with what you would have for the 
um, even a bit confused, right? Because you are in a homogeneous system here. Yes, yes. yes. And they would expect that in a Fermi liquid, right, your uh, momentalization time becomes infinite. And why is then this relaxation time not quite infinite? While the, the, the linear momentum relaxation time is infinite. Or, yeah, what I say, rate is uh, zero, yeah. It is large, but it is not infinite. Now, there are other terms entering here. I just plotted here the, the so it's that I understand. Square. Maybe it's basically saying, I read this as, uh, Right, so when you have a normal Fermi liquid in a uh, electron system, right, you have a uh, unclap potential, right? And uh, because the unclap potential is off-shell finite, that's right, irrelevant in deep, deep, deep IR, right, you pick up as the leading order correction, this kind of T squared, I presume T squared lock me over T in two dimensions correction, right? It sets the uh, uh, say resistivity, blah, blah. And I would expect that when you're in a continuum, uh, all these relaxation times, right? So it's basically a transverse relaxation time. You look at the whole response that should also uh, divert you, would think. Uh, where does this momentum go? We had some discussion about the lighting, right? And it's basically the same theme. And we're not pretending that I understood anything deep about the whole uh, viscosity. A bit, a bit uh, mysterious. Mm -hmm. No, but your question is if I am in the Fermi liquid regime, why does this not go to infinity, correct? In the homogeneous continuum. In the right. homogeneous continuum, yeah. correct. I wasn't expecting it to be infinite. I mean, this is related to the electron electron scattering rate, and this, uh, this this scale is always fine. Yeah, yeah, because how the dynamical, right, the, the viscosity itself knows about the collision times. Yes, yes. And now you just have, um, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And now you, now you have the, the cyclotron frequency, right? And it needs to be paired with, say, time in order to get a result. And mm -hmm. it should be it, right? It, it's different from. Uh, mm -hmm. Indeed. Indeed. It's yeah. a bit spaceless thing. I just sort of the clue, I guess. Mm -hmm. Anything the patient uh, full has to know about the relational symmetry breaking, but this thing doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, can, uh, we can chat about it further. Uh, Please. Sure. Really yeah, but not now. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is the setup. Um, consists of, again, the two, our two dimensional channel. We have the applied electric field, electrons get pumped towards the positive x direction, we form a uh, fluid here. And now on top of this configuration, we turn on a magnetic field. Since our fluid is charged, it will experience a Lorentz force. And therefore, we will have a local gradient. I mean, electrons will push, in this case, to the, to the lower middle of the channel. And we will parametrize this effect by means of this delta mu, okay? Our delta mu is a gradient in the chemical potential with respect to its equilibrium value due to the effect that we are having a finite magnetic field. Now, and this is going to be the key uh, of the talk, the most important thing of the talk, this chemical potential gradient will receive two contributions that I will explain carefully. One contribution that we will refer as Lorentz contribution will be essentially determined by how much fluid do I have. Uh, it will be proportional to the integral of the, of the fluid velocity, how much longitudinal momentum fluid do I have. That's contribution number one. Contribution number two will be given by the, not the integral of Vx, but to the slope of Vx, how much does my velocity profile change when I move across the channel? This effect will give us a force, another force, that that's the one we will going to be after. That one, that force will be proportional to the whole viscosity. 
and therefore what remains of the talk and in particular when we refer to ways to experiment to, to isolate this experimentally will be in essence ways to determine to isolate this force this whole viscous force essentially uh, just a small remark we will focus on graphene because we know that it behaves hydrodynamically quite well but in principle this can be extrapolated to any other material that you can think about that can behave hydrodynamically. There's no problem at all in this sense. Uh, excuse me, may I ask a question? Okay. Uh, so this uh, chemical potential would basically uh, control the density? Or is yes, it? The dens yes. So, so this... should I think of density variation? Yes. Across... yes. Oh, so, so, okay, but is it incompressible? Or yes, it is compressible. Uh, it is compressible. It is incompressible. So it's think about of water. If you try to compress it, you will generate a huge pressure gradient, and this pressure gradient will be. We will see it in the in the equation. Now, incompressible. Okay, let me let me make a quick uh, statement here. It's incompressible in terms of hydrodynamics, meaning that the divergence of the full velocity profile will be still be zero. Okay, but it's true, you will squeeze one region here, of course, because you will have a large so, so the density is not constant across the channel, right? Exactly, exactly. So, so, so okay, so that's allowed. And uh, it is related to this chemical potential. So it's basically should be a measure of this deviation of the density. It is, yeah. This is yeah, proportional uh -huh. to, the, to the charge fluctuation, yeah. Okay, through so like some kind of compressibility or something. Yeah, partial P or partial mm, spectrum. Mm. Yeah. And okay. Mm -hmm. and, and you assume that you are close to equilibrium, so you, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. thanks. So this mm -hmm. variation, no problem. This variation is small compared to the background chemical potential in this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. No problem. Mm -hmm. So, um, can, can I also ask, uh, can I also ask a question? Please. So on this picture, you have electric field Mm -hmm. And then you have gradient of the chemical potential. Yes. Uh, so normally, yeah, it's not that the fluid moves in this direction. It's just an. Uh, no, no, no. The, yeah, I'm just asking. Normally, when we measure response, like current, right? We measure response to the electrochemical potential, which means electric field and gradient of the chemical potential. They kind of bunch together, and you have the uh, gradient of the electrochemical potential. So why do you talk about the chemical potential sort of separately? It's because I came from hydrodynamics. So yes, uh, yeah, it's a matter of, of defining things. I believe that my chemical potential is your full electrochemical potential, nothing more. So it's essentially our way of parametrizing the Lorentz effect. Uh, it's a matter so, of notation. Uh, so can I, 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 I might disagree actually. So, so this delta mu, uh, it's probably, I think what you said before is correct. I mean, it's probably the density, but, uh, but maybe indeed the question is, uh, then your electrochemical potential has mm -hmm. to be probably constant because otherwise you would have a current, mm -hmm. right? So the chemical potential is fine to change, but probably electrochemical potential should be constant because okay. otherwise, yeah. 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 No, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Totally. Is that yeah. the... Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm also that's a follow up of the previous question. Yes. Yes. So, so, okay. So, electrochemical. But current, right? No, but there is no current across the channel. Well, so I no think current, there's no current across the channel, but that's what, that's the, that also the, the electric field is directed along the channel, right? So that means that the gradient of your chemical potential is also directed uh, along the channel. Oh, no. oh, uh, I think delta mu here, if I understood it right, is is the change across the across the channel. But I might be wrong. Across the channel? No, no, you're you're totally fine. You're totally correct. Yes. So it's across the channel. Uh, so, so, mm -hmm. so there is a there is a whole field actually that probably equilibrates the the current that would be induced otherwise. Yes, that's the thing that we are going to examine. Yes. Yes, yes. It will come. I believe this is this is just a matter of how we label things. But I 
hope that everything will be clear once I introduce the equations and explain them and and all the all the all the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but but still, it's important to to make no, sure no, no. that del the delta mu you mean the same thing that we we mean, right? So exactly. so delta mu is basically just the chemical potential and its variation across the channel. Basically, tells me that there is a variation across the channel of the density. Yes, and also the pressure. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and so my reflex was to saying that delta mu has to do with the whole voltage. Was that? It is a whole voltage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's all voltage. Right? It's exactly. Uh, I think you can still get any response about it. I think you were safe when you think that, right? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So so basically, this variation of delta mu has to be compensated by the variation of the uh, potential due to whole voltage. Mm -hmm. So so that there will be no current. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Across. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No. On, a, on a conceptual level, now that we're discussing this anyway, can, should I think of the electric field as an external parameter, whereas delta mu is, you know, it's an internal response of the fluid? Uh, you mean the, the transverse electric field? Yeah, that it's something that the fluid develops spontaneously because of the whole viscosity, whereas the E field is something you impose in order to get the, the whole thing flowing. Partly because it's, you have a non-vanishing whole viscosity, and the other part because it's a charge fluid in motion. Okay, good. That's the so one of the when we did, when we examine this uh, this and the two contributions, mm. one is proportional to the charge. Yeah. Therefore, it's I refer to it as Lorentz standard yeah. Lorentz, but other part will not be proportional to the charge, wow. and it requires only having uh, parity and time reversal breaking, which of course it's a it's due to the fact that we have a magnetic field, so everything is but, related. But in any case, it's nothing that you impose. It's something the fluid reacts and creates it's on its own. Reaction, yeah, yes. OK, good. Exactly, exactly. So and once we develop the It's a whole effect story, right? Hmm? You, have a, you drive your current in one direction, and because you have a field, in order to force you get the voltage build up, and there's no current running in the transversal direction. Correct? Yeah. Yes, yes. There is no special magic for one. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I'm sorry, so you're saying that the parity is broken, that's fine by, but uh, why would magnetic field break this parity? I mean, I think it is an axial vector, so I, I might uh, get it uh, get it wrong, but uh, I, it seems like it is invariant. In two dimensions, you can write it as a, in terms of a vector potential, and this vector potential breaks the parity breaks the parity symmetry. Well, the, the vector potential does, but the, the field that is the, cur the curl would, would not flip under the inversion, right? So this is the axial vector. So you probably meant you break it maybe by some other means, by, I don't know. I think the field breaks a mirror plane symmetry. That's the correct phrase. Oh, oh, oh. okay. So, so you need to break mirror, but mirror is not identical to inversion, to parity. So it's a different symmetry. Okay, but that's what you need, right? So you need a, to break a mirror, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so indeed then. X to minus K, X bar, that's the that's that's point, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, fluid hydrodynamics, there are, to my knowledge, there are two ways of doing, uh, carrying out a fluid description. One is take your Boltzmann equation and derive the hydrodynamic limit, you will get the hydro, the Navier-Stokes equation, the Euler equation, and and so on. But the description that we will take now will rely on the symmetries that you have in your system, and it's a relativistic description in the sense that it includes corrections due to the fact that you are your fluid may be large compared to the Fermi velocity. Uh, these are our equations. This one is automatically satisfied. We are incompressible, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. This one will not be important for the present purposes. And the stress tensor equations, on the other hand, will give us the navier stokes equation for the velocity profile, for the parabolic velocity profile. And it will give us as well the pressure equation that we will examine because there it's essentially the force equation, the, the equivalent to the to the to the Newton's force equation, balance equation. And from there, we will read off our whole voltage drop. So, so, so it seems, it looks like a, just a relativistic uh, 
uh, expression with Fermi, uh, like a speed of uh, light. But uh, I mean, the underlying theory is not relativistically invariant. So I, I'm not sure how that comes about. Okay. I will not say anything about the uh, underlying relative uh, theory that you have. So in principle, you can take this and you can fill up with the, with the equation of a state that you have. And from there you do physics. This is just hydrodynamic formalism. No, I mean, t the expression for T mu nu. Yes. That you have, that you have uh, downstairs below. Yes. Uh, yeah, so this one is U alpha and then it contains, so is it expression that, okay, maybe it's not requiring Mm, any spe specific symmetry, and maybe it's generic. Uh, rotational. Just rotational invariance, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And no bulk viscosity here, otherwise you would have a trace contribution here. Mm -hmm. But this U alpha, it looks like a four velocity to me. A three velocity, because we are in yeah. three dimensions, but in general, yes, it's the, it's the, mm -hmm. This is so a gamma factor, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So, so this gamma factor seems like something relativistic, and then you need it in order to ensure relativistic invariance, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure where this symmetry comes from in this system. I mean, we have we are in the lattice, and we have, I mean, it's so then why would V Fermi plays the role of the speed of light? Because the fluid cannot move faster than the than the Fermi velocity than the velocity of the, of its constituents, so we are limited in that sense. So, is your question of why does the Fermi velocity act as the effective speed of light in this? Yes, I might ask it this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's the because the fluid cannot move faster than the than the than the velocity of its constituents, which is the the, the Fermi velocity. You're bounded from above. No, just there is a bound. That's that's why. Yes. That, that that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is this in any way relevant to any experiment? I mean, the Fermi velocity is uh, graphene is very high. Mm -hmm. I don't mean, you ever get into the regime that these relativistic questions matter. Okay. We. I will talk at the end of the talk okay, on, good, on yeah. that. I will address that. Yes. Yes. Very. Very good. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I will refer to that by the end of the talk here, because there are some indications, some some simulations that point out to the fact that if you're on, I mean, not that you have a fully relativistic uh, developed fluid, of course, that, but at least that you might have nonlinear contributions other than the convection term, for example, entering into the entering into the the equations that may become of some relevance. There are some numerical indications. That's all that I want to to make. But I will uh, can I, I will can I make a comment? The end of the talk. Yeah. Uh, can I make a comment? So mm -hmm. I think uh, I think you either uh, missed something here or um, didn't explain it properly. So the the way you wrote the field tensor, mm -hmm. you have a sort of a fully relativistic a tensor for the electromagnetic field, mm -hmm. right? Now the electromagnetic field, uh, even if you write a relativistic theory for it, it would obey the proper Lorentz invariance with the speed of light. You are asking me about the V enter into the into these components over here. Well, so basically, I, I'm I'm sort of saying that if you want to be consistent, uh, then on one hand you could correct your fields uh, tensor by writing the velocity, this V Fermi into some of these components. Mm -hmm. But even then, you're not going to achieve the full uh, proper relativistic description because out of the four Maxwell's equations, two will still be violated. Mm -hmm. um, so in some sense, um, it is, so if you put this velocity into this tensor, you will have a semblance of a relativistic notation, but your system, your, your, sorry, your theory will still not going to be Lorentz invariant on one hand. And on the other hand, you seem to be studying linear response. So your velocity is supposed to be small anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not entirely clear uh, what is the point to use the relativistic notation at all. 
the point is to have to show that when you do an expansion, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I didn't want it to, to overcomplicate the explanation. It's not like we are going to examine the fully relativistic theory, but we are interested in examining possible nonlinear effects. Meaning that when you do your expansion in assuming that Vx is much smaller than, in this case, than Vf, you end up with a linear equation. It may happen that this equation might be altered by nonlinear effects, like for example, the convection term or other terms that might show up, quadratic terms, for example. And well, the, 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 classical, the classical Euler equation is already nonlinear. Yes, due to the convection right? term. So yes, this, other the realistic terms. nonlinearity mm -hmm. is going to be, uh, for small velocities, is going to be smaller than this Euler nonlinearity, right? Because Euler nonlinearity doesn't have a speed of light there. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. But still, they may be, they may be important. Well, mm -hmm. important. They may be also of some relevance. That's the that's the point. But yeah. Okay. So the most yeah, you have the convection term, and then you may have other nonlinear terms that maybe become important, uh, relevant. Okay. Yeah. Actually, uh, it's an nonsense thing. Right? I'm kind of confused about these claims that. The mu nu has anything to do with those effects. I mean, this is the electric magnetic field tensor in the rest frame. Right? So uh, I read this as you're basically dealing with static electric and magnetic fields that don't do anything. And you have to worry about the fluid velocity Vx relative to Vf, right? It's basically about a neutral mm -hmm. system, not so much about the way you drive it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because that is really, you have to make the case right, that that matters. Uh, I understand the intuition of the gentleman is yes. also obvious that. Yeah. The and these are applied close to VFs. Mm -hmm. That it really starts to show up in experiment. We'll continue, David. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah. indeed. These are applied fields. Yeah. Mm -hmm. May I maybe suggest that we move on? And uh, if this is still a pressing issue in a few minutes, maybe we can come back to it. Mm -hmm. So, um, last but not least, we introduce, we introduce by hand this momentum relaxing piece uh, proportional to the, well, given by the momentum fluid density and inversely proportional to the momentum relaxing scale. And essentially we put here all the momentum relaxation mechanisms that we can think of by following the inverse Matheson's rule. So nothing, I believe that this is quite extended. In our case, we will have uh, two contributions. One, the impurities, and secondly, the phonon, electron phonon scattering uh, mean free path that will become, of course, more relevant as we increase in temperatures, meaning that for large temperatures, we will have a rather small uh, momentum relaxation length. Now, and here it connects what I explained before, we focus on the linear regime to the velocity profile, to the drifted velocity, to the drift velocity, and we end up with these two equations over here. Now, the first equation is nothing but the puzzle equation in presence of impurities. You have another piece that induce some modification to it, et cetera. But this term, for example, is much is going to be much smaller than this one, for example. That just to wanted to point that out. And secondly, we have the pressure equation, which essentially is the force uh, equation, telling us two things that the local change across the channel, the local change of the pressure across the channel is driven by two things. Firstly, a Lorentz piece proportional to the electric charge and the background density times the velocity of the fluid, of course, think of it as some fluid Lorentz uh, contribution and another contribution proportional to the Hall viscosity. And now what we will want to do. This is essentially the, the whole voltage drop or related to the whole voltage drop once you evaluate it at the boundaries. What remains of the talk is going to be how can we distinguish this contribution from this one, which is the one that we are after that we want to isolate. Sorry, may I ask one other question? So in the first line, uh, so we, we are doing a linear response, right? In, in the electric yeah. field? So in then the delta profile, in the, but yes, in the end of the day, you will get that the velocity profile. Well, either we do linear in, in field or not. I, I just don't know. 
-hmm. So whatever you say, but mm -hmm. uh, but then Delta Mu also is driven by the field. So I'm not quite sure why we keep this high order terms here. This one? Yeah. Okay. Delta Mu times E X. So if it's uh, linear in E, right? Should I? Should they, yeah, so I don't understand why to keep it then, or is it a, or then why don't we keep uh, at higher order terms? Uh, in principle, the expansion, we didn't make it in terms of EX, but in terms of VX over VF. Oh, so and it's nonlinear, nonlinear theory in electric field. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, okay, so, so then, okay. So basically then these equations are, uh, have has have all these terms, uh, but you just keep the leading order in in the velocity over the Fermi. That's what you are saying. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Yes. Mm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, wait a second, wait a second. But then I don't understand because um, you you said before that the continuity equation is uh, sort of automatically uh, fulfilled and is not important. Now, continuity equation. So you're you seem to be uh, considering a static case, yeah. right? Then continuity equation is a gradient of the current. Now, current is then the density times your velocity, right? Mm -hmm. So if you claim that the divergent divergence of the velocity equals to zero, mm -hmm. that is more or less in linear response, right? Because in this divergence of the current, there is also a derivative of the density. So your delta mu. Now, so if you um, so normally if you do linear response, then you're saying that within linear response, this derivative of density in the continuity equation can be neglected because velocity by itself is linear response quantity, right? But if you want to go beyond linear response, then you have to keep this derivative of density in your continuity equation. And therefore, it's not automatically fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So then, but but here I don't see this continuity equation. So then, uh, because we are now in the linear regime in terms of the velocity profile, it's the first part of the statement. No, 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 not in linear regime in the velocity. Then you then then you cannot have this um, term with the delta mu times electric field, because they're all right. Electric field is uh, something that drives the velocity. Your velocity. So within linear response, your velocity is linear in the electric field. If velocity is linear in the electric field and delta, and delta mu is also linear in the electric field, then this term here is quadratic in electric field. Mm -hmm. It is, of course, allowed to study electric current beyond linear response, mm -hmm. right? You can want to, you might want to study the sort of the next order, right? So your current would be conductivity times field plus something times square of the field, right? You can do that. But if you, and, and then this term here that you, wrote, that you wrote, that term should contribute. But then if you do that, then you have to take into account the corresponding terms of the continuity equation. And then in addition to this, you have to consider then the Joule heating, which is also of the second order. Right. Joule heating is given by E x squared, but it depends on sigma q. We do not have sigma q. Sorry, what is sigma q? No, no. Uh, Joule heating is a uh, electric heating. current times electric field. It has nothing to do with any sigma. You were saying that the way I saw the Joule heating term is sigma q times E x squared in the in the in the what, current. What what what's sigma q? What sigma q? Uh, the intrinsic conductivity that you have. So here you have rho u mu, and then you have, according to the Einstein decomposition, you can have it plus sigma q times e x, blah, blah, blah. It's, uh, it's called. Well, I mean, see, here, here you have this relativistic notation that can be, in fact, confusing in that limit. But if you just simply remember the standard sort of first year electrodynamics, right? In the first year electricity theory, you are taught that there is an Ohm's law, which is current proportional to the field. And then there is a concept of Joule heat, which is something that is square of the, in the field, right? It's proportional to the current times voltage. So it's a second order in the field, right? So now here in your first equation, you have a term that is second order in the field. 
If you keep a term that is second order in the field, then you have to keep the dual heating, right? Um, I suggest to go at the, end, at the end of the talk if you want to this, to this, to this scenario, because sure. I think that maybe we have a different uh, way of notation or something, but mm, I think I follow your, I think I follow your point. Anyway, uh, once you determine this numerically, you see that this is a small, so you, you can think of it just kept as some uh, piece and then any other contribution that you may have from nonlinear effects to the, to, the, to the current equation are small as well, are negligible as well. So um, within this description, you have the whole voltage drop measured at the, at the, at the boundaries defined as the chemical potential gradient at W minus at zero. That is the, the whole voltage drop. The whole field is read as the derivative of the chemical potential. This is the way of, we, sorry, I think I went too fast. Um, is defined as the derivative of the, of the whole of the chemical potential. And it receives two contributions in this case from Again, examining the equation for the pressure. I'm sorry if, if it takes too long, we can skip it actually to the end. So just tell me. Uh, so the, the, the field, which is the gradient of the electrical potential equal to derivative of the chemical potential means that basically there is a zero derivative of the electrochemical, right? So that's the condition of no currents across the channel. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, mm, thanks. No, thanks to you. So this receives two, contri this receives two, two contributions that we examine separately. We have the whole viscous contribution proportional to the whole viscosity times other parameter and proportional to the second derivative of the velocity profile. And we have what we refer as Lorentz contribution, standard Lorentz. This stands because it has a form that resembles the standard Lorentz effect proportional to the applied magnetic field times rho, the charge density, charge carrier density, times the velocity profile. Once we take the integral of these quantities in order to read off the, the, the chemical potential, we find that this is proportional to the integral of the uh, longitudinal velocity, proportional to, to, to I, the longitudinal current, and this will be proportional to the first derivative of the velocity profile. How much does my fluid change across the channel? And we have this parameter space. We have the charge carrier density, the temperature, the applied magnetic field, the slip length that essentially parameterizes how much is my, how large is my drift velocity at the boundaries. Although in principle, we take it to be zero you can take it to have any finite value in principle. The width of a channel and the applied electric field. And as I mentioned before, the pressure gradient is proportional to the, to the well, to the derivative of the, of the chemical potential across the channel. Now, we define this quantity and this is nothing but the, what I've just explained before saying essentially that the whole voltage drop receives two contributions, one proportional to the fluid density, to the moment, longitudinal momentum fluid density, and another one proportional to the derivative of the velocity that we evaluate at the boundaries. And long story short, the whole voltage drop will depend on how this cause effects. And Checking, right? So your delta phi B is just a Lorentz force contribution. Yes. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. That's why we refer to it as Lorentz contribution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this will depend on whole viscous effects. And what remains of the talk is to distinguish this, to isolate this contribution from this one in this measurement, which is what an experimentalist will give us. He will give us this quantity over here. Now, there exists, I want to stress that there exists a competition between these two contributions, the Lorentz and the whole viscous contribution, meaning that the Lorentz contribution uh, scales on how much 
fluid longitudinal fluid momentum density to a half but the whole viscous contribution since it is given by the slope of the fluid velocity profile it somehow encodes or captures transverse momentum flow that we have and there is ex I, all that i want to say is that there exists essentially a balance a, a competition between how much longitudinal momentum do i have and how much transverse momentum do i have did you say there is no transverse flow Mm, there is no transverse flow. There is no, okay, there is transverse flow. There is VY. Uh, tra ah, okay, transverse flow in the sense that, yeah, there is not. There is not. Properly, properly speaking, there is not. Uh, I do not want to, 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 to complicate the, the, the explanation. All that I want to stress is that one contribution will scale on how much longitudinal momentum do I have. And another one will scale on how much my profile is bended. Full story. That's that's the that's the the, the basic statement. So, so the 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 whole the whole viscosity would depend on the profile you're saying, right? Yes. Yes. The derivative okay. of the profile. Yes. The derivative of the profile. Derivative. Okay. So then you know, but that would also depend on details like uh, how much screening you have. Some some other things, right? So that would be quite sensitive then to this. Yes, yes, yes. It's complicated, yes. Also your input parameter space is quite large and you will see that this is, this quantity is sensitive under changes of- Like for instance, if I include Coulomb interaction, you know, like in a, in a usual system, I know that the charges would go into the edges and sit there. Mm -hmm. So that would be very uh, irregular profile, right? So most of the density would be at the edges, like in the in this case, but then depending on the screening lens, it might be somewhat relaxed, and then mm -hmm. the the this profile would be modified, mm -hmm. yeah. and that that would affect also the uh, whole viscosity contribution, right? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, yes. thank you. So, no problem. Thank you. So edge effects, yeah. One way of, is to 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 say that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I was thinking on the on the slip length. Yeah, for example, we parameterize how much drift velocity we have at the boundaries by means of this LS, and that of course affects your 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 whole viscous contribution. Indeed, there's in our papers we have a full explanation on that. So far, I will take LS to zero and go on with 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 that. But that's what that's one thing that came to my mind when you when you said this the the ls i just wanted to mention that mm -hmm. uh -huh. so but that's a separate separate thing from this yeah yeah yeah, yeah, right? yeah absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> again it was something that came to my mind but let's just add. <laughs> um last but not least we have well, we show that the Lorentz contribution and the whole viscous contribution have opposite relative sign this is of course not uh, it's independent on the direction of your magnetic field and so on. It is related actually to the to the electron charge, which is negative, meaning that since they have opposite relative sign, there is a magnetic field that we will label by critical magnetic field at which both contributions will cancel each other, meaning that the whole total whole voltage drop should would be zero. This is what we um, expect. Now, in general, as I mentioned, under changes in the parameter space that I showed you just before, anywhere that we, and this is more or less a general rule that will apply in our, in our results. Whenever you have a very large longitudinal fluid momentum density, you will have a lot of Lorentz uh, contribution and very little hull viscous contribution. And therefore, you expect a diminution of the hull viscous contribution. So if you say, okay, I want to place myself at a configuration that this whole viscous is highly, uh, is highly, is enhanced, then go to, for a, uh, to a configuration where you have very little longitudinal momentum density, but your profile changes a lot. Just, uh, just that. Now let's move to the whole viscosity at small temperature. We run our simulations, we solve our velocity profile, and we get uh, a set of data. Now, this is the whole voltage drop across the channel. 
as a function of p on the left figure and as a function of rho at different temperatures um, and as a function of rho at different temperatures on the right uh, on the right figure also for the left figure and what we see according to the to our convention if this chemical potential if this whole voltage drop is positive we have a lot we speak of a dominate whole viscous dominated region and on the contrary if it's negative we expect we have a uh, Lorentz dominated region meaning that from the two contributions the one that is dominating is the Lorentz contribution are these calculations done for graphene uh, they they are intended to do on graphene, but they can be applied to 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 other material. The change the changes are in the equation of a state. Well, no, I, but I just wonder why did you use such low temperatures? Because experimentally, yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of dynamic yeah. Yeah. Very much yes. Yes. Um, a schematic purposes, uh, just show just theoretical purposes. Of course, you don't add hydrodynamic here, so yes. Yes, indeed. And you expect ballistic contributions, uh, nuts and layer formations, even at higher temperatures. So, yes. Mm, just, so which, just... which value for the whole viscosity have you used? Which value? We took the yeah. theoretical predictions here. So these are, sorry, these are given here. Here. And for the shear viscosity, we took 0 0.3 kilogram per second. But again, Mm, this is this is a formalism. Now, to what you apply the formalism, mm, there's no problems. There's no major problems in this. Uh, in, another issue related to this. Uh, can you go back to to, to uh, where you just landed, right? Uh, the results. Mm -hmm. Big issue. I did. I am sorry. What you were uh, telling us. So uh, I guess you assume uh, that. Uh, Take a situation like you have Fim, right? And uh, you have to uh, go away from charge neutrality. And I guess you go with your firm energy above the charge neutrality point so that you have an excess mm -hmm. of negative carriers, right? So your Lorentz force is that associated with, with, with negative uh, charges. And I presume the, uh, the, the, the whole viscosity contribution that's independent, I guess, of the charge of the carriers. How is that? Yes, yes, yes. That's the yes, thing, right? Yes. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now they are opposing, actually they are opposing because the electron charge is negative. Yeah. If you were talking about holes, that your system is, that your, your charge is positive, then both contributions would, should have a, would have the same sign. Yes. Right, so the practical thing you should tell the experimentalists go always, which you can have potential caffeine above the charge neutrality point because then the uh, signs of the two contributions are opposite and you have a better chance to see it. Yes. Yeah. In relation to this, there's another reason why we go into very large chemical potentials, and which is related to the fact that you rule out thermal gradients. There's no problem at all when uh, when working with thermal gradients. We are actually doing uh, doing that. I will not present all results in this talk, but yes, you would talk about Nernst effect and so on and so forth. But now this, because we are in the Fermi liquid regime, thermal effects will be disregarded. And this is the second. Again, this is not a problem. This is just a, a comment I want to, to, to make. Now, um, yeah, that's, this is pretty much. And this is the local chemical potential gradient across a channel between zero and W. We took five microns, for example. Left figure for 10 Kelvin. Again, this is merely a uh, schematic, OK? Uh, just to show the the theory, again we assume hydrodynamics applies in all our, in all of our computations, and the left figure is at higher temperature, 100 Kelvin. Now, focus on this. This one will serve me to illustrate what I what I want to emphasize, which is the change between a whole viscous dominated region to a Lorentz dominated region. The violet curve is when you have a whole viscous dominated, uh, you are whole viscous dominated. And as we increase the magnetic field, we jump to a configuration where there is, you are, you become Lorentz dominated. 
Now, the critical configuration that I showed you, that I explained to you before, would correspond to have an S shape in your chemical potential, which I believe should be one of the greenish curves that you have here. Now, this you this means that you would have zero uh, voltage at the boundaries, but locally inside of a channel, you would have a non-zero signal. Sorry, what was the screening lens that you took here? Uh, the screening lens? Yeah, because you know, if you have change of the density, yeah. uh, if you have some screening effects, it would tend to make it more charge neutral, yes. you know? So I would, I would guess that it would depend on it. So I'm just asking what was yes, the number yes. for it? Yes, it depends on it. Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> so I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I do not remember. I because I, I would think that experimentally you might say that if you, uh, you know, the, the gates that control the density, mm -hmm. the distance to the gates would somehow affect the screen lens. And you can also make, make it, uh, you know, to serve to increase or change this contribution. Mm -hmm. because that would affect it also. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yes. Thank you. No problem. I would kindly remind everybody that uh, we've had quite a lot of questions, but we've already passing the hour. So wow. just keep that in mind for the rest. Uh, OK, uh, let's move on. Um, yes, so whenever you have um, at small temperatures, there is a high negative magnetic resistance effect, according to the to the that follows from the expressions for the hot, for the shear viscosity that I showed you at the beginning, meaning that if we increase the magnetic field, again, this is merely schematic, okay? Uh, we don't want to, to, of course, we know that there is a Landau level formation at some point. As you increase the magnetic field, you have an increase of the velocity profile, which gives rise to a higher longitudinal momentum density, and therefore you enhance the Lorentz domination of the, of a whole voltage drop. And in general, you have, therefore, you have a suppression of the of a whole viscous contribution. This is a why, this is a, the explanation that we have. I mean, microscopically, when you have the, the electrons that scatter a lot between themselves, when you put a magnetic field, the electrons that would scatter in principle, now they tend to be bended so they do not scatter quite often. And when you go to the, this statement, when you go to the hydrodynamic description means that there is less friction between adjacent layers, giving rise to a diminution of the shear viscosity as you increase the magnetic field. This effect has been already reported in the papers that I, that I, that I mentioned before. Now this plot is the critical point configuration. The, critical magnetic field at which both contributions cancel each other. Again, this is merely schematic. I mean, really small temperatures, what we have here. Um, and just quickly mention that as we increase the density, there is an enhancement of, a, of a, there is an increase of a critical magnetic field. In general, when we increase the density, we increase the whole viscous contribution. This is a general statement that we saw in our simulations. And roughly speaking from 50 Kelvin, at the density examine, there is no critical magnetic field. Now, this uh, partially what was discussed before that you, it's really, it's, it's really impossible, almost impossible that you can be hydrodynamic at, at such small temperatures. Now we focus our attention to trying to disentangle the whole viscous contribution to the Lorentz contribution when you are at room temperatures, when you know that you are hydrodynamic, for example. Again, I refer to graphene. Hydrodynamic uh, behavior in graphene is optimized if T is large. I mean, this follows from the diminution of the, of the electron electron mean free path. Uh, this is uh, going to be our input parameter space. Mm unless otherwise mentioned, we will focus on room temperatures and zero slip length. Again, you can set a finite slip length, results will change and so on, but I do not want to go to over that level of, of detail. If you are curious, we can talk at the end of the talk. And just quickly, since the Gurji length is going to be rather small because we have a short, a small momentum relaxation, 
it is expected to see momentum relaxation through the like uh, behavior in our velocity profile. We will constant to still be hydrodynamical, but our observables will be highly affected by momentum relaxation by through the behavior. Just quickly, this is a plot of the velocity profile as at as a, a different magnetic fields, and we see. I want to stress that there is very little change of the um, of the velocity profile from for this magnetic field range. We will go to that uh, in a in a second. And on the right plot is just the same velocity profile, but at different densities, corresponding to very very large density and smaller density, as we have here. Now. Concerning why the velocity profile changes so very little with uh, with the magnetic field, the answer to that is that the electron-electron mean free path is very, very small. And therefore, no matter if I put a magnetic field, the electrons will collide with each other quite a lot. And this does not, this will not lead to a change in the shear viscosity, and therefore my velocity profile will be almost unchanged. Now the longitudinal current is spread in this, we define it in this, in this manner. We make some simulations of the velocity profile at different W and the longitudinal current at different W. And what we see is a linear behavior in, the, in W, which is typically relatable to drude like physics. If we have, if we observe, for example, well, not for example, if we observe a W to the cube behavior in, y, in Ix, then it means that we are highly parabolic in our in our in a, our velocity profile is highly parabolic very poisson you can say um just quick remark on the things that i said just now vx vx is highly affected by momentum relaxation this implies that the longitudinal current scales as linear as a linear function in w at least for the applied fields that we have employed. And secondly, the velocity profile does not change a lot as a function of B. And long story short, we can see this mathematically, but also intuitively from, the, from what I just told you. Mathematically, we have this function over here, which is proportional to V squared, uh, one over T to the four. And we have, if we have a very, very large temperatures, it requires very very large magnetic fields in order for these factors over here and over here to become important now a natural question is okay this also multiplies this factor over here therefore i would expect to have a very very small hole viscosity this is a problem yes this i mean your hole viscosity in this regime in room temperatures is very very small but still and that's the, the final part of the talk. There are ways to look at it because it will still become um, considerable or non-negligible in a local uh, across in, a, in local sections, in particular close to the boundaries in the in the channel. Uh, this one, I think we can skip. It's just the it's just the just the total the total chemical potential drop and overall fall voltage drop. It's the same behavior than we have before. And we, we run out of we run out of time. So one procedure to isolate this uh, whole viscous contribution from the Lorentz contribution is by looking, this is the signal that an experimentalist would measure. This is the local chemical potential gradients across the channel. Uh, since the whole viscous scales as uh, as the derivative of the profile, and we have a very very flat profile about the middle of the channel. We can say that our whole uh, that our chemical potential signal is mostly Lorentz dominated at the middle of the channel. With knowing this, we can make an extrapolation from the from the analytic formulas that we derived that are carefully explained in the paper i will not uh, go to, into them in into them in detail we can extrapolate this and examine what is the difference between the extrapolated lorentz signal and the measured signal and that will tell you 
what is the whole viscous contribution, which again, it is, uh, it is not negligible uh, close to the boundaries. That would be one procedure. It, this is an approximate procedure, by the way. There are, there are of course, as, as you might uh, imagine, there are um, uncertainties related. There are errors. It's an approximate uh, procedure. Secondly, we can look to the whole field under some assumptions, we can derive analytic expression for the whole field. If some, someone with an experiment measures the local whole field, we can try to do a perfect tuning, a uh, perfect fine tuning of our theoretic expression to that experimental expression and read off what is eta h and eta, for example. Just wanted to clarify that if we plot the maxima of the whole field as a function of b, we get a perfect linear behavior. But this is related to the fact that we assume that the whole viscosity is proportional to b at small magnetic fields. If you if it doesn't if it if it is not, then you would see a deviation from the linear behavior in this plot. I just want to point that out quickly. Uh, this is like I think we can we can we can go over it. If you are if you have questions, we can go with it. It's just the width dependence on the on the whole field. And last but not least, we have the, we can read off from the pressure equation, the following force balance equation. This, the left-hand side of this equation is nothing but the whole voltage drop. And it has to be equal to these two elements over here. The first element is the Lorentz force. And the second element that we have here is a whole viscous force. One can do simply a two-dimensional linear fitting, uh, measuring the whole voltage drop, the longitudinal current, and the applied electric field. Of course, these are these two are related through the through the longitudinal resistance, but we just wanted to plot the results in this way. And from doing this fitting, read off what is eta h over eta. Uh, I will end the talk just with some very quick conclusions and outlook. The best configuration in general from the, from the analysis that we have carried out to see a very large whole viscous contribution is small temperatures, large carrier densities, small applied magnetic fields, and small width channels and very, very small LS drift velocity. From there, we can say, OK, one possibility in theory uh, maybe not to graphene, but to any other material, to estimate eta h is to go to the critical configuration at which the whole voltage drop vanishes, and from there solve the equation, and we can read off. Uh, we can read, yeah, we can read what is the value for eta h. And at room temperature, on the other hand, we have some enhancements. Although the signal, the whole viscous signal, is smaller. Than, the, than it should be at, at uh, than, the, than the counterpart at, at small temperatures. We have still a non-vanishing, a non-logigible whole viscous contribution close to the boundaries. And that allows us to point out the methods, the procedures that I mentioned to you before. One is direct subtraction. Secondly, uh, the, the, sorry, the force balance equation. And thirdly, knowing the whole field analytically under some assumptions and do uh, an, a fine tuning. Of course, these three procedures are can be done simultaneously. There is no problem with that. And then last, uh, for the for the for the input parameters that we have examined, turns out it seems that the velocity profile can actually be, if not terribly large. This is for graphing if not terribly large, at least large enough to make ourselves think of what happens to nonlinear contributions, which will have to be examined carefully as we, um, and as some of you, uh, of, of you in the audience ask, we have to examine them carefully. Um, yes, so yeah, up to a channel width of this, and from this applied electric fields, we saw that nonlinear corrections, I mean, some preliminary estimates show that nonlinear corrections to Vx may start to become important. And 
we can address to them. That's all, and thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much. Uh, like <coughs> we have quite a lot of questions during the talk. Are there any who still have stamina for more? I'll take that as a no, <laughs> in which case we will release the speaker uh, and we will thank him again. <laughs> thank you. I hope I haven't killed you from boredom, all of you. Thank you for attending. <laughs>